Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Cozine. And I'm Tracy McCray. Heart disease is still the number one killer in America for both men and women. Every year, one in four deaths is caused by heart disease. Heart disease includes a wide range of conditions that affect your heart, including blood vessel diseases, such as coronary artery disease, heart rhythm problems, and problems with the heart valves or heart muscle itself, among others. The term heart disease is often used interchangeably with the term cardiovascular disease. A little bit more fancy. Cardiovascular disease generally refers to both heart problems and blood vessel disease that can occur anywhere in the body. In an ongoing effort to raise awareness and promote prevention of heart disease, each February is recognized as American Heart Month. And here to discuss is our favorite Mayo Clinic cardiologist. No one else is in the room, right? <laughs> Dr. Stephen Kopetsky is here. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Kopetsky. Thank you very much. I wouldn't have even thought the difference between heart disease and cardiovascular disease. Right. It, uh, we use them interchangeably. It gets confusing. I agree. What are the risks for heart disease in this day and age? The risks, unfortunately, are many. The number one risk factor now for heart disease that has passed up cholesterol, passed up blood pressure, passed up smoking is diet. Mm. The food pattern that we eat. And is that something that you think is going to be easy to swing back the other way? Or is it, are we here to stay for a while? It is, uh, it's taking off. It's going to be a problem. And a couple of reasons. One is our kids. 100% of kids under age four overeat. It's not their fault. It's their parents. It's us. It's me, you know. Uh, when we get to patients or, or folks that eat uh, too much of the wrong foods, addictive foods, uh, added on calorie foods, there's a lot of that. 60% of our calories come from these things we really don't think we can control, but we really do, like the automatic foods we eat that we don't even think about it. You sit down, you order your food at a restaurant, they bring you some bread and some butter. All of a sudden, the bread and the butter are all gone. What happened to it? Well, I and I'm it. not so hungry for supper anymore. Right. 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 right, right, exactly. So it's just very, very common, this issue with the diet throughout kids, adults, everybody. So tell us a little bit about um, some of the connection between high blood pressure and heart disease. Yes, high blood pressure. Uh, so even uh, small amounts of high blood pressure rise can cause real trouble with your heart. Why is that? Well, you'll say, patients will say, gee, Doc, my blood pressure is only a couple of points over where it should be. I'll say, yeah, but your heart pumps 100,000 times a day. So think of that, 100,000 times a day, it, multiply that by whatever percent or numbers your blood pressure is too high. It takes too high of a toll on your poor little heart. Then you gain a few pounds. Every pound of fat we gain is an extra five miles of blood vessels. So if your heart pumps 100,000 times a day, times five, that's an extra half a million miles per pound, a million miles per two pounds. You get the math. Yeah. So this all adds up, and it really does wear out our heart. And what we eat really affects our blood pressure too, right? Oh, exactly. Lots of salt, a lot of sodium. Uh, we don't, we're not active enough physically, which opens up our blood vessels. The bigger the blood vessel, the lower the pressure. You know, The bigger the pipe, the lower the pressure. So we really are working against ourselves, I'm afraid. And I just uh, heard a piece on the Mayo News Network recently about the menopause and how uh, menopause can affect your blood pressure because as your hormones change, then you gain a little bit of weight and uh, sends you kind of down the same pathway. I didn't think of menopause as being a risk, uh, though. Yes, and the earlier menopause is more of a risk. Sure. So that's one thing we ask women. When did you have menopause? Was it in your 40s versus your late 50s? That's a, a difference for your risk. And pregnancy. You know, pregnancy, I think I admire any woman that's gotten through pregnancy, but if their blood pressure was high, if their blood sugar was high during the pregnancy, that's a risk for more problems later in life. Yeah, and that's definitely something we don't want to forget about is to remember to ask women about those issues during pregnancy and thinking as they go on in life. What about, you know, my mom or dad's history? How does that affect me? Yeah, you're, you know, the acorn does not far too fall from the, far from the tree, as you know. And if it happened early with your mom or dad, Early being uh, early for a woman before age 65, early for a man before age 55, because men tend to get their disease about 10 years before a woman. So if it's early, and uh, it's not just your mom or dad, it could be your grandparent or a you know, brother, certainly something like that. Those are the things we need to pay attention to. Let's talk about the cholesterol numbers, because there's the LDL and the HDL, yeah. and what they really mean. Yes. The way I remember it in my simple mind is, is LDL, we want to keep low. 
HDL you want to keep high because uh-huh. LDL is lousy and HDI is healthy. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we can raise the HDL with physical activity. That's the best way we found. Stopping smoking, your HDL will go up within six weeks. Um, eating lower fat foods is helpful too. LDL is more medicines, unfortunately, but it's also diet. Recent studies have shown that diet really can affect our LDL. And if we're eating a lot of high saturated fats, animal fats specifically, that'll raise our LDL. Is there one that's more important than the other? If you get where your LDL is too high and your HDL is too low, is there one way that you should attack it first? Should you try to raise the HDL? <laughs> yeah, the uh, that's a very good question. And uh, I think we have to do a little bit of everything. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't just fix one thing and, le- and sure. let the other things uh, go off. The We do encourage folks to be physically active and interval activity where you go hard for 30 seconds, 60 seconds, that'll raise your HDL more. We do encourage them to eat uh, less uh, animal-saturated fat, eat more olive oil, uh, avocado oil, nut oil, as, uh, which is a very healthy oil, uh, eat more fruits and vegetables, less red meat. Those things really do add up. It's called the Mediterranean diet, which helps many diseases, not just the heart. Absolutely. How, is, how do you ultimately diagnose heart disease? I mean, is someone comes in, is it just a conglomeration of doing a blood pressure and an EKG, or how do you figure it out? When we say heart disease, we usually mean there's something that's gone wrong. The mm-hmm. artery has gotten plugged up in the, in the heart. The valve doesn't work the way it should anymore. The heart rhythm is abnormal. Remember, the heart has plumbing. It has electricity. Mm-hmm. It has all these different parts to it and doors that open and close. So we have to diagnose each individually. It starts with a good history, talking to the patient, saying, what do you feel when you're doing you know, activity? Can you lay down flat? Do your feet swell, et cetera? Also talking about family, you know, did your mom or dad have similar problems like this because this can run in families? Then listen to the patient. There's this ancient meth- uh, this uh, thing we have, some call it, called a stethoscope <laughs> wow. that we <laughs> I know that we use. Um, sound wave tests, echocardiogram, stress tests. It depends on the disease, but you usually start with a history. In fact, one of my mentors here told me, if you don't know what's going on when you finish the history of the patient, don't even bother doing anything else because you you should get all you need to know from where you should go to what road to go down from take, talking to the patient and taking mm. a good history. So during the month of February, right, it's American Heart Disease Awareness or right. American Heart Health Month? Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. Is there something that we could, an opportunity here to educate people a little bit more? Well, the, yes, there is. Uh, everybody kind of, this is when you're going to start seeing billboards out by the airport that say, you know, <laughs> get your loved one a, a heart CAT scan, you know, mm-hmm. and love your, uh, you'll see a lot of things. I don't know why the shortest month is the month for the biggest <laughs> killer. Because um, there's a heart in it. Yeah, yes. that's right. It's You're the only right. way. That's, when you eat a lot of candy, doesn't yes. make any sense, right? That doesn't work. Uh, but we, uh, the opportunity is just to raise awareness. You know, a woman, as you mentioned earlier, as the intro, that a woman at any age is more likely to die of heart disease than of breast cancer at mm-hmm. that age. Uh, what's the number one killer of women with breast cancer? Heart disease. Mm. So we really do need to raise awareness, and it's all about prevention now. We really need to prevent the disease. We cannot wait until it occurs and treat it. So what? It, let's talk about prevention quickly before we take the break. And well, what are some treatment options? If someone does get diagnosed with heart disease, do you start off with a medication right away, or do you try to attack it with diet? Yes. Or both. <laughs> well, it's pretty much both. Mm-hmm. I mean, everybody needs a little better better, better diet, mm-hmm. needs a little bit more physical activity. That's good for everybody uh, in almost all cases. But in general, medications are very helpful. If you have arteries that are narrowed, you're getting some discomfort in your chest or shortness of breath when you exert yourself, you know, nitroglycerin, long-acting nitroglycerin-type pills, some pills that make it so the heart doesn't have to need as much blood when it mm-hmm. pumps can be very helpful. Uh, If it's a blood pressure problem, your pressure's too high, the heart's working too hard, the valves are leaking, whatever, treat the blood pressure. That's usually diet, obviously, and and lifestyle plus medications. We've been talking about heart disease with cardiologist Dr. Stephen Kopetsky. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll turn our attention to the cholesterol-lowering medications known as statins. We'll also talk about some uh, how to prevent heart disease and we'll also get some exercise tips because, you know, that's one of the things that we should be doing. We all but need more. Yes, we'll have a myth or matter of fact. If I have diabetes, I can't take a statin medication. 
we'll find out next. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Cozine. And I'm Tracy McCray. We're talking about heart disease with Mayo Clinic cardiologist, Dr. Steve Kopetsky. Time to talk about the very popular statin medications. Yeah, but first, myth or matter of fact, Dr. Kopetsky, diabetics cannot take statins. Is that a myth or a fact? Big myth. Why do people think that? Why is that even? Well, because the we found, it's after the statins were on the market for 20 years, we found that, that diabetes can actually be brought out by being on a mm. statin. And it's usually, though, the patients that are going to become diabetic anyway, they're, they have it a few months earlier than they would have had if they didn't go on the statin. The other thing is, for every patient that does become diabetic, five heart attacks are prevented. Hmm. When it comes to statins, are more and more people going on them, or are cardiologists kind of backing off prescribing statins? No, I think that there are more. I mean, the new guidelines that came out two months ago increased the number of people that should go on statins. They added more criteria to include when you're considering putting a patient on a statin. Now, the flip side of that question are patients taking the statins. Uh, We know that about 20% of people that get the prescription don't fill it. It's a three-month prescription. About half the people almost won't get their second prescription filled. So pretty quickly, they get off it. Well, Uh, some patients have side effects from statins that... They don't appreciate They worry a lot about the side effects. That's a big discussion, sort of a big negotiation. Yeah, it is. And, uh, you know, this informed process, it's you need to have a conversation with a patient about it and tell them, I tell them, you know, you may get muscle aches. And but the studies show only one or two percent of people get muscle aches. But that's because the way we did the studies, we excluded people Mm -hmm. that have had muscle aches with statins in the past. So we never got them in the randomized, you know, trials. So it may be 10, 15, 20% of people that get the statins. But like you mentioned, Elizabeth, the, uh, the big thing is the people that won't even take a statin because they are afraid of getting side effects. And those are the ones that I think is a bigger group than the ones that get side effects when they're on a statin. So if I make up my mind to take my statin, Big Macs for the rest of my life? Well, you know, patients, I had a patient say to me the other day, Doc, can I have the statin so I can eat whatever I want? Mm. I said, it doesn't work that way. In fact, we know that if you do not eat healthy, like Mediterranean fruits, vegetables, small amounts of red meat, less dairy, uh, more olive oil. If you do not eat that way on the statin, your cholesterol numbers look better, yes, but your heart attack rates and your stroke rates and bypass rates do not lower. So your numbers look better, but you still have the bad cardiac events. So we know that you really do have to eat appropriately, even if you're on the statin. When it comes to the the side effects, the um, the muscle aches that you were talking about, the only people that I know who have ever stopped taking statins are my father in law and his mother, and they both had muscle aches. Mm-hmm. So this may, I always think about the pharmacogenomic piece of it when mm-hmm. we started interviewing people to that end. Are, do you think that as people get more information about pharmacogenomics, is that something that um, are, are statins showing up in those reports that people are are having done? You know, we, we've done studies here. Others have done studies. There is not a single mechanism mm-hmm. for statin intolerance or muscle aches. And they're just like there's not one single gene that's responsible. We do know we, we did a study here. We didn't find any genes that predicted muscle aches. We did find a gene that prevented that uh, that prevented muscle aches. Mm. It was actually Gilbert's disease, mm-hmm. the, uh, the mm-hmm. liver. Uh, you have a higher bilirubin. It's a benign disease. But some people get, mus- get uh, muscle aches that are more likely to get pain in the dentist chair. Some people have fibromyalgia at baseline, sure. and they're more likely to get muscle aches. So it's, so it's a multifactorial issue. What's kind of your quick elevator speech to that patient who is reluctant to even consider a statin? Well, I say it's all about risks and benefits. And number one, you're the boss. If you get muscle aches, you stop it. Call me. Let's wash it out for months and you know, start you on something that you can tolerate. I don't want you to hurt. Because I, I tell them frequently, I, you're looking at a person right now who's been on six statins. A few years ago, I couldn't get out of bed one morning. I thought I had rheumatoid arthritis because I was so stiff, and it was the statin I was on. Mm. I stopped it. It got better, started again, came back, et cetera. So I tell them, you're the boss. Number two is your risk is here, high. The risk of statins is low. Then that's, you ought to try it. You know, if you don't want to, you know, it's your mm-hmm. decision. However, I think in the long run, it can really benefit you. If you have heart disease, then that's a no-brainer. If you have narrowing of the arteries, you should be on a statin. Let's go back to preventing heart disease. What are some tips for prevention that you have for listeners? Well, the uh, number one diet, 
I encourage pers- people to change their diet, but not abruptly. I say I use the word migrate mm-hmm. a dozen times a day. Please migrate to this healthy di- food pattern. I don't call it a diet because I say diet and everybody folds their hands and they, they start, <laughs> right. you know. Diet's never good. <laughs> Diet's not good. I say I want you to eat a healthy food pattern. Mm-hmm. And here is one that we've outlined and take this quiz and try to do it over a year or two. Mm-hmm. And it can really help you. Take small amounts. Get a hamburger, cut out a part of it and put some black beans in there. You know, something healthy. And it's been shown slow changes over time you can tolerate and not feel deprived. The second thing is physical activity. You know, that's really great for your heart. It's amazing how good it is for your heart and your body. And just, again, small doses, five minutes, ten minutes, a few intervals. Uh, don't feel like you have to go to the gym for an hour. We don't have, nobody has time for that anyway. 150 <laughs> minutes. Yeah. You make time for it. <laughs> that's tough. But small, small doses you can, you can do. The next, control two habits, smoking, which is none, alcohol, which is small amounts. I don't encourage people to drink if they don't drink. And the third thing is you need to promote things that heal your heart. Mm-hmm. One is sleep. We know that sleep is restorative for your heart. You've got to get good sleep, and there are all these problems we do with computers and bed and such. The other thing is the, the stress, the social, the support. You need to have support. You need to have people helping you, you know, friends, spouses, whatever, loved ones, significant others, a family that will support you, and that in turn supports your heart. Be optimistic. I tell patients when you go to bed at night, think of three things that good that happened to you today, that's been shown to reduce heart attacks after three to five years. What about supplements? Is there a role for that in helping prevent or to treat heart disease? That's a great question. And supplements in general, no. There are a few supplements that are good and some that were bad. Uh, The ones that are good, we know some supplements like uh, oatmeal, oat bran, lowers cholesterol, Stanols and sterols, lower cholesterol. What are some stanols and sterols? Uh, there are things you find in like um, soybeans, but you have to eat a couple of bushels of soybeans, so you have to buy them over the counter. They're not, they're not prescription. You can find them in juices, yogurts, pills, mm-hmm. things like that. And then psyllium seed is very good to lower cholesterol, also lowers blood sugar. Um, those are good. We know the things like uh, aspirin. If your, your risk uh, is high for a heart attack, more than about 10 or 15%, uh, if you don't have bleeding problems, aspirin can actually help you. There's been a lot of negative press about it recently. Some things are not good. Beta carotene is not good. High dose vitamin E, high dose vitamin C. I'm not talking about multivitamin dose, mm-hmm. but high dose is not good. The thing is we just don't have a pill that substitutes for lifestyle change. Right. And exercise. If there could be an exercise and diet pill, that would be perfect, wouldn't it? You know, we need to invent that, Tracy. <laughs> okay. You I know, can... you said something earlier, Dr. Cozine, uh, the elevator speech yeah. that a cardiologist would give. What kind of speech? You're the front line. You're you the know, primary I have carry. a pretty similar elevator speech, right? too. I say, you know, one of my classic lines is, my patients who have been successful, and I say, what is it that you did? And they say, oh, it was easy. I changed my whole life. Mm-hmm. And... You know, that's funny, Mm -hmm. but then really you think about it, you make those little changes over time and that adds up. And I think one thing that I really encourage people is they don't know how good they could feel. Mm -hmm. And once you start exercising and eating a little bit better, your energy levels shoot up and then you have more energy to do the stuff that helps Mm -hmm. make you feel better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where does the front line of this happen? I mean, if somebody has heart disease, if something happens that they're not feeling so well, I would imagine first time anybody sees them is the emergency room. Do they first come to they, your You know, physical? I would say many times they're coming to me first. You know, there's your your health plan wants you to have a oh, lipid panel every sure. year to get whatever that credit is mm-hmm. on your insurance. And so the numbers come back and think, oh my gosh, what are we going to do with these? And then so I work with the patient to interpret what those values mean and decide what are we going to do about it? And usually what we're going to do about it is diet and exercise and follow up. So I'm always making sure that there's a follow up piece because you can't just say change your life and then send them off into the breeze. You know, <laughs> gotta support people. Like yeah. you said, make sure there's family yeah. support. But when I get in a jam, you know, I send my patient to someone like Dr. Kopetsky. In mm-hmm. fact, I share many patients with him that are struggling with statins or maybe we need to get onto one of the fancier new medicines that I'm not as familiar with. Team-based approach. Mm-hmm. That's what we do. Right. <laughs> and I would agree with everything you said, except it wouldn't be diet and exercise. It would be healthy food pattern healthy. and vigorous leisure activity. <laughs> vigorous leisure activity. I need to refine my lines here. <laughs> You've got it right from the horse's mouth I'll, here. I'll, 
February is American Heart Month, and we've been talking about heart disease and statin medications with Mayo Clinic cardiologist Dr. Stephen Kopetsky. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks for having me.